Hey everybody, welcome to the show, or welcome back. Hey, this is the show where we interview the very best of sales leaders and understand first, why did they get into leadership? What's the distinction there between the motives of getting into sales leadership and what differences have they found and what is working today to get the very most out of their team and have it be fun along the way. Uh, before we get in, make sure you check us out over at b2brevenue.com where you can learn about all the stuff that we're covering as far as driving revenue in today's world. And at the very end, I'll sum it up. Let's get into the interview. Hey, Helena, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm excited to spend some time chatting sales with you. Um, so my background, gosh, I was raised in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and I actually still live there. And uh, I am the first generation only child of two Lithuanian immigrant parents. So um, I feel pretty scrappy and competitive by nature, right? Um, and it's it's been a necessity to, to still stay humble, right? Because we didn't have a lot, so I had to work for everything I had. But it served me really well, I feel like, in sales and in my overall career. So um, I currently have the honor of leading the uh, corporate account sales team for Univar Solutions. So I guess the best of the best, commercially speaking, um, who call on, on, on our company's largest and most strategic accounts. Cool. And has the yeah. biology degree paid off or is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess, I guess that'll, that'll tie back to sort of my background, right? I got two disappointed parents that I didn't become a doctor, right? Because every, every immigrant parent wants their kid to be a doctor. So uh, junior year of college, I was like number one disappointment and uh, not really though, but, uh, but yeah, so I would say that with a, with a biology degree and a chemistry minor, I, I can pronounce the chemistry we sell a lot quicker than most folks. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's, it's truly sales at the core of it. Yeah. But how did you kind of get into sales? What was the kind of the bridge between biology degree? Was it that you didn't want to go into medicine or you had bills or you wanted a year off? No. no. So I, I sort of woke up junior year and was like, oh my God, I really, really hate this. I mean, <laughs> like, I really, really hate this. The lab time, the intensity, it just, it just wasn't me. And it came easily to me, which is why I think I had decided to pursue that as a, as a major, um, except that my heart wasn't in it. So I called home and I told my parents and they were like, you're a scholarship kid and we can't afford to send you to Denison. So if you change your major to something like marketing or art history <laughs> or business, we're not paying for your college and you're coming home and you're going to Cleveland State. And I was like, oh God, no, 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 no. I'm going to finish in my med school track. Um, I actually took a job as a recruiter. Um, that was my first job out of college, right? Totally random. September of my senior year, I get this job offer and I'm like, well, hell, I'm taking it because then I'm done, right? I'm employed. Everything's good to go. I just got to knock out senior year and we move on. And um, my dad was really upset because he's like, I just paid for this really expensive, even though it was scholarship, right? They still had some to pay um, education at Denison and, and you're wasting it being a recruiter. So this was back in 98. So he's faxing my resume behind my back to chemical companies thinking he could bridge the gap of technical degree with you know being a people person yeah. um and that was that was sort of how it how it happened and he's in chemical sales also right so near and dear to his heart oh so he's a sales guy he's a sales guy yes and, and, and actually my mom my mom is too she's really? a salesperson mm -hmm. that's interesting because usually when that background that the idea of going into sales they understand what it is mm -hmm. where you know, people from other professions look down on it, like that it's yeah. not a great career. Yeah, it's it's been a great career. I, I have loved every bit of my my commercial journey. And was it natural growing up with two salespeople around that you kind of osmosis um, of learning? So, no, I don't think so. And when I, when I think about my dad, I don't think of him as a sales guy, right? He's He's pretty quiet. I mean, he's definitely not a type A. Yeah. Um, he's very pragmatic, almost too pragmatic sometimes where I'm like, Ooh, like you could come across kind of like a jerk, right. In a sales call. Um, my mom is totally the opposite of the spectrum, right? Super nice. would give you the shirt off her back. She's a natural, natural seller. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of in the middle, right? So I'm, I'm a people person and I'm comfortable building the relationships, but I'm not a cheerleader, if that makes sense. Sure. You know, if I kind of see her as a cheerleader. I kind of see him as, you know, 
super quiet, conservative, kind of, you know, starchy. Um, and I sort of fall in the middle. So I think I got the best of both sides of it, to be perfectly frank. And was it a natural fit for you? It yeah, I, I, it never, you know, I interviewed and I never really gave it a thought of like, what does sales mean? And what am I going to have to do? It just, I connected with, um, with the gentleman that I was interviewing with, with my first chemical sales role. And he was a great mentor. Um, and yeah, it, it came, it came naturally. So kind of like the, the biology degree came naturally, this came naturally and I didn't even know that it would. And I loved it. And what did you like about it? <sighs> you know, I think the ability to solve a problem for a customer, right. And truly bring the value and, and see them get past. And, and, you know, this is, this is years of, of selling, right. So this, this didn't come on day one, but, but the getting them past the fractional penny, because in our business, right. I sell commodity chemicals, right. We sell raw materials. We, we die on a hill over a quarter of a cent, right. Cause it matters when you're selling millions and millions of pounds of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so getting the customers past just the actual price piece and, and getting, building the trust of, we'll get you competitive, but there's so much more that we bring to the table. Well, let's talk right. about it because a lot of people fall into the price trap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and I always say, well, your company exists for a reason. It's probably yeah. a lot more than just you're the cheapest. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think, um, the key to any seller's. I think success is building the trust, right? So, so building the rapport, being genuine, um, truly understanding what skin in the game each of your stakeholders has, because it's going to be different, right? Depending upon where they sit in the org chart, in the operational side and in the mix. Um, and then figuring out what the why is. And if you can figure out what the why is and what's a win for each of these people specifically, right? And you may not hit all of it, but if you focus on the consensus, right, of what a win looks like, um, I think you get them off the price conversation, but you can't do that without building the trust first. Because they won't believe you. They won't. Yeah. They won't. And and part of building the trust is executing, right? You got to execute on some of the that's, small that's stuff to prove yourself. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Showing 100%. up, saying, doing what you say. <laughs> put up, put up, and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. And too many people just don't think that's important, but it's always important to them. <laughs> It's, it's critical. I mean, to me, I don't see how you can sell and that not be your absolute number one paramount focus. Yeah. The rest and, will come. And what is their why? I'm, I'm sure you, you, given the dollar amount, you're dealing with a bunch of different people over time span. Yeah. So we sell into multitudes of industries and businesses. So trying to define the why in, in a broad scope is really tough. Um, it depends upon the industry that we're selling into. It depends upon um, a lot of the, so, so when I think about the strategic accounts that, that my, my sellers call on, right? It's the largest companies. It's, it's the, the Dow's, the DuPont's, the BASF's, the big guys, right? So a lot of the um, why in their decision-making falls into do you corporately align, right, with what your foundational and cultural visions are? That's huge, yeah. right? They, they want to do business with companies that have a similar focus um, and a similar culture and a set of priorities, right, that are that are similar in nature. Um, so I think I think understanding and digging into the research, right, and, and validating that that is driving the decision, right, of finding the why. Um, some of it is something as simple as solving an operational issue, right? Hey, the supplier is not showing up. If you show up, you can get the business, even if it's a little bit higher in price, right? Because running the plants is much more important. You shut a plant down, it is millions and millions and millions of dollars. So it could be as basic as that, or it could be as complex as, you know, meshing two companies' cultures to truly understand what that needs to look like. So today you're leading a team. Is that true? Or you work within a team or... Yeah, so so I am I am leading the corporate accounts team. Um, I have uh, corporate account sales directors that report to me, um, five of them, and then there are corporate account sellers and a team wow. of business analysts, um, consolidation specialists, and some bid specialists that roll up to the team as well. So I'm I'm technically leading leaders, but I'm commercial at heart, right? I mean, I came up doing this job. I was a corporate account manager. I was a corporate account sales director, and now I'm leading the team. So. It's it's kind of a cool like I don't know like a like a rags to riches story. I guess. <laughs> but 
it is good. And mm -hmm. what was your motive to get into leadership? You know, it's funny you said that. I was talking to my husband last night. I'm like, oh, God, I wonder what he's going to ask me today. And, you know, I'm sure part of that, because I, I, I heard some of your other podcasts and I, I listened to them with, with some frequency, but, you know, hey, how did you get into leadership? And was it natural or was it, you know, sort of like the next career step? And I never, ever intended to be a leader. I My, my goal was to be like a killer career salesperson, right? Um, but I was blessed with several really amazing mentors along the way. Um, who really pushed me out of my comfort zone. And my husband was like, you're not going to give me podcast credibility for pushing you to, because I've been telling you all along. And I said, okay, we'll make sure you get you know, podcast cred that you were part of that journey as well. But um, it was it was always instinctual for me to, to coach and to lead. Um, and I think I fought it because some of the companies I had been with previously, the leadership roles felt very managerial, like, or, or like administrative. Administrative, not, yeah. Yeah operations not, nope um so i was always kind of like ugh, you know my, my perspective of what a leader was wasn't necessarily that positive um and that really shifted when i got to univar um the, the mentors that i had through my it's going on nine years now here at univar um really has changed that perspective for me and it, and it really kind of happened organically like i didn't you know it wasn't a decision of okay now my goal is to become a sales leader it just it just sort of happened and and how do you not get sucked into the operations administrative side of it? Because it can be just a a never ending <laughs> job. Yeah, yeah. So so the machine is big, um, and and the machine can be it's very hungry. hungry. Yeah. It, it will it will eat you up, um, and it can be pretty soul crushing, right? I mean, you you think about we're we're a highly highly matrix organization. Um, and it takes, you know, 17,000 signatures and blessings and everybody to be in line to say, yes, go do it. But I don't know, there's a part of me that sort of, I love it, but I also sort of get off on leveraging the machine, right? Yeah. To best execute in the real world and, and bringing the visibility to the stakeholders of like, hey, the machine's really great, but we just need to pivot it, just turn it a quarter of an inch this way and we can really go kick some butt, you know, in the marketplace. Um, so, so I have a... I, don't know, I feel like I've got a brand internally, right, of sort of cutting through the BS um, and being able to to sort of neutralize it all and look at it from a what works in the real world. I'm, I'm a huge back to basics person, right? There's not a ton of complexity in selling. You can make a lot of complexity around it, but right, but it, but but at the core of it, it's build the trust, do what you say you're going to do, right, and then make sure you execute. Yeah, and, but how about is like. You know, because I worked in a matrix organization, and if you don't control your calendar, somebody else does. Yeah, 100%. You have to be judicious in what meetings you take, um, and you have to you, know, you have to get to a point where you're selfish with your time. I mean, I calendar my strategy time. I calendar my thinking time. I'm coaching my, my leaders to do the same thing because, you know, in a, in a highly transactional business, right, where I said, you, you know, we, we die over a quarter of a penny and you're, you're shipping millions of pounds, you can really get caught up in a lot of the day-to-day, -day, this order didn't go and why didn't it go and sort of getting stuck in that and, and um, not leveraging the network, right? Because there's, there's another thing with sellers, right? You're, you're type A at, at, at the heart of it and you want to do it all yourself and you can't. You can't. So being, being, I think, judicious with your time and cautious with your time, right, and making sure that you're committing to the right stuff, um, which becomes clear as you're, as you're in a role longer, right? You, you know sort of where you need to spend the time and where you don't. And what were kind of your epiphanies when you became a leader? Because when you're the, the great rep and you love being it, you want every – the traps tend to be you want everybody to sell your way. You want to – you know, still have your hands on the deal. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I do, I always did my best work sort of tackling the wounded customers, wounded teams and strategizing through that. Um, and I think through that approach, even as a seller, I recognize that there's, you know, 10,000 different ways to skin the cat. And just because, you know, I might be the Kool-Aid man busting through the brick wall, right? And that might be my style. That isn't necessarily going to work or be natural for somebody else. So I don't know that I've ever wanted my team to sell the way I sold. I've never viewed it that way. What I, what I want and what I expect from my team is that everybody has as much heart and passion as I do 
right? So I would never ask them to do something I wouldn't do. Um, and I certainly wouldn't put my style on them. So I think, um, I don't know that I ever fell into that trap. I think, I think being conscious of that through the process of having to influence a lot of other folks to get stuff done as a seller sort of prepared me to not fall into that trap. Yeah. And what do you look for in the leaders that you bring into the company or move up through the company? Yeah. So it's, um, it's been interesting. I've, I've rebuilt two teams now um, in my last, in, in this leadership role, as well as my prior leadership role. Um, and, and I, and I came from the group. So I, I, I had a bit of an advantage, right? It flattened my learning curve of knowing where to go kick the hornet's nest and, and kind of go dig in to understand if, you know, what I thought was the truth was actually valid. Um, cause sometimes you think, you know, but you don't know until you're in it. Right. And that's, that's my big cautionary thing of you think, you know, it all and on day one, you're going to come in and you're going to fix it. And you're like, Oh, well, holy crap. I was, I was actually wrong. Right. My perception of something or someone wasn't actually accurate. So what I look for when I'm, when I'm promoting leadership onto my team, um, or promoting somebody onto my team, I, I prefer to promote internally. Right. I mean, somebody bringing knows. somebody in. Yeah, from the outside to, to learn the big machine um, is is tough. And I actually just did that with the, my most recent hire. Um, my, my director of uh, business development for corporate accounts is an external hire. And part of that was on purpose because I needed a fresh set of eyes coming from a different industry to help us infuse, right, what we're doing here and get us to the next level. My commercial leaders, right, so the folks that are actually leading my corporate account sellers, that to me is is pretty much got to be an internal hire. I'm looking for somebody who's naturally curious. Um, you know, you always want people to be smart, but I feel like smart means so many different things depending upon the individual smart and what, sort of yeah, <laughs> yeah smart, smart at once. So like, I'm not looking for somebody who's necessarily got an Ivy League degree, but somebody who's naturally curious and who wants to continuously improve yeah. um, and learn and is open to thinking outside the box. Right, because you get you get very myopic when you're doing what could, like I said, it's a tactical sale at, at the core of it. Um, and you start to sort of lose sight of what does that vision look like and how do we organically continue to grow year after year? And, and so, do you ha have enough options where there's people that are proactively wanting that role or are you looking for people like yourself that kind of are doing it kind of the go to person? So I'd say I have both. Um, and what's what's really nice is we've I've worked really hard over the last, I feel like I was sort of on my own campaign trail when I took this role because I I'm almost a year into leading the team, um, the entire team. And uh, I've worked really hard to sort of be on my own campaign trail to, I don't know if I want to say rebrand, but re-educate the other stakeholders and the rest of the people at Univar what corporate accounts actually means. We were this like, mystical black box where stuff just happened and nobody really knew and it it felt a little a little bougie it felt a little standoffish like we weren't collaborating and that wasn't the intent it was just sort of how it was coming off so i think that all of the work that myself and my team have done to educate people and pull people in along with the along with us on the journey has helped make this a team that people want to work on right so so the bench that we're building and the folks that have interest um, are, are both of those types of people, right? That, that you had mentioned, right? So I've, I've got the option to those who sort of naturally just fall into it and those who definitely know that they want to be a leader. And this is something that is, you know, core to them out of the gate. And was there much of an adjustment to do that internal selling? Because a lot of great reps kind of ignore that. They're like, here's the order, fill it, fulfill it, please. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of passion and pride on my team. So I think that having the opportunity to re-educate and sort of bring people on that journey with us um, was something that the majority embraced. And you always have a couple of folks who are like, yeah, don't bother me, right? I'm just going to go kill it and sell it and let me get my check and I don't really care about the rest of it. Um, but, I, but I think the majority of the team really has a, has a lot of pride um, and, and, and they want their team to be viewed positively and they want everybody to understand all the, the great things that we're doing, all the challenges that we face, right? Our business is different than the local seller. It just is. Um, and it's not that we're trying to be different or we're trying to be, you know, the upper echelon or better than somebody. It's just that fundamentally the business just runs differently. And what is your why? What excites you? What keeps you clearly passionate about your role? <laughs> What drives that? 
Um, you know, I got to tell you, really seeing um, the development, mm -hmm. I think, is what drives me, right? So, so the development from a business perspective, right, and watching the actual business grow and watching you know, my brand evolve and sort of how people view my brand, which I consider my team, right? Because it's, I, I'm the face of it, right? At the end of the day. Um, but but watching my leaders grow, I've got two leaders who are brand new um, to leading commercially. One one led, but led in the, in a, in a local sales um, <clears throat> arena. So different than this, right? This is, this is just, the stage is so much bigger. And, and watching them develop over the last, I don't know, 10, 11 months has just been fantastic. And I felt that same thing when I was leading, when I was a sales director and I was leading the sellers, right? Sort of watching the sellers evolve, right? And think differently. And it become natural for them to become more curious and, and more um, disciplined, right? Around their research and their preparation and not just the willy nilly of I'm just going to show up and, you know, hope like hell that I get the sale. Because that, that seems to be a key distinction, between the people who love to lead versus the people mm -hmm. where it's just the career part of it or it's a stepping stone to something else. Because as a rep, we're kind of on the opposite side. We get a deal, mm -hmm. our territory gets cut, our quota gets, goes up. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of constantly get that handicap and we have to rebuild mm -hmm. every January where a leader compounds. Yep, yep. I would say that I, I have a... A large majority of the sellers on the team um, also have a challenge slash fixer mentality. So there's a there's a hunger to take an account that is wounded or a mess or you know bleeding yeah. um, and fix it. Because yes, their goal is to make money, and yes, they want um, the recognition and the continued growth. But the trajectory for a career seller, and we've got a lot of career sellers that are sitting in corporate accounts, and and you know, yes, I want those who want to do something else and we need to have a bench of leaders, but career sellers are phenomenal. So if you can create a track for them where they continue to have more exposure and larger accounts and, and a yeah. bigger scope, right, that's attractive to them. So it's it's not a scenario where they're like, oh, God, if I kill it this year, you know, I'm going to be screwed next year. Um, I'm sure there's some that feel that way, but but the majority of the folks that we've that we've got and, and by design, right, that we've yeah. wanted and asked to be on the team view it differently. And when can you tell somebody who wants to be a leader has a lot more work than they think they do? Oh, um, so I think, you know, the, the folks that, again, this goes back to the natural curiosity, right? From the standpoint of those who I think instinctually maybe want to lead, but don't know they want to lead are the ones who take on the extra projects and, and they wanna help get something done or a barrier knocked down. Um, the career folks who wanna be a leader because it's the next logical step, yeah. right? Those are the ones where you sometimes have to have the hard conversations of, um, hey, listen, you, know, you're, you, you think you want this because it's the next logical career step, but these are the tools and the skills you really need to work on and refine. I mean, I'm, I'm very direct and transparent with my team. So any feedback, um, that lands on a talent management review, any thought of, hey, I don't think you're ready, they're going to know, right? Because feedback is a gift. And, and if people truly want this, then they need to understand where their deficiencies and where their opportunities lie. Um, and that's for me and my leadership team as coaches, right, to impart to them. And, and how do you keep that culture <laughs> where feedback is a gift and not a criticism? It's, you know what, it's, it's a non-negotiable for me. Um, so it's, it is the absolute foundational core for my leadership team. Um, and I know that it's their foundational core with their team. So I don't know how you keep that. I feel like you just, you, you focus on that being um, one of the most important things that you can do for, for your sellers or your leaders, right, is to continuously offer the feedback. And it's tough. I've had, you know, with some of the new folks that have come in there, this is like, oh, this doesn't feel good. And you're like, yeah, it doesn't feel good. But if you know it's coming from a good place, right. um, it'll, it'll start to feel better and you will start to do it and not even realize you're doing it, right? Because it becomes part of your conversation and your feedback loop as you debrief about a customer call or you debrief about a presentation. Um, you know, we've had some knockdown drag outs on my leadership team calls, right? Where, where people melt down and, you know, you hang up and you're like, wow, you were a real jerk. Right. And here's how you came off. 
and you're allowed to have your opinions, right? But we're still leaders and you, and you got to focus on the positive messaging still, right? So it's, it's that balance and that fine line. So we, I feel like we hold each other accountable, which is nice. Um, and that's part of what I was looking for when I brought my leaders in, right? And part of what I'm looking for when I bring the sellers in is their ability to, to have that resilience um, and to be bold enough, right? To offer the feedback, but to also take it. Because it, it is a gift. It is. Right? Because it is. It, instead of waiting till the problem becomes unsolvable, solve it mm -hmm. as soon as possible yep. and, you know, treat it like coaching. hundred percent, hundred percent. Because that's what yeah. it is. It's not perfect. It is. And look, we all want to get better, right? Everybody wants, I, I truly believe everybody comes to work every day wanting to do their best. They do. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Right. I mean, I don't wake up today and go, oh, I'm going to do like a 50% job. I'll today. mail it I'm gonna, in. <laughs> I'm mail it in today. No, I'm going to wake up and I want to kill it. And I want to kill it every day. And if I'm doing something that's not letting me kill it, I want someone to tell me. Yeah. And, and does the rest of the company have that? Or is it more you or is it more your team? Or I think it's, I think it's really, really a, a strong foundation on our team. Um, but I would say culturally, um, yes, Univar absolutely embraces that. Some teams do it better than others. Um, you know, we, we went through a huge integration uh, back in 19 where we bought our one of our largest competitors. And it's been a really long road with an SAP integration and a shared service center stand up. And, and really, I think the biggest challenge was the cultural integration. And we were similar, but still really, really different, if that makes sense. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on the cultural piece. So yeah, I would say that it's, it's definitely a, a core value for us as a company. Um, to you know provide the feedback it's a gift to um i guess hold up our peers right and, and and push them to the best that they can be and is that something you look for strongly in the interview process the ability to I take do. that i do and, and it's a it's a tough thing i haven't found i feel like interviewing is just a, a weird science right i mean it's it's a lot of it is is gut check and i know that you know hr like they lose their mind when they say that. I'm like, oh, my gut says it's not right. And they're like, well, what does that mean on paper? They're kind of like, my gut says no. And, and you got to follow, you got to listen to your gut. Um, so we do a lot of panel interviews. I do a lot of group interviews with the team to see how somebody interacts. Um, and then we do a feedback session actually after the interview with the candidate Good. to say, hey, here's where you really did great. And hey, here's what sort of didn't land or didn't resonate. Um, and whether you get this job or not, it's feedback for you, right? When you're presenting yourself in an interview, um, that this is, this is what we, what we gleaned from it. Yeah. And I think that is key. And if they come back to you and say, can I get another chance to, and to show you? You know, I think I would give them another chance. I mean, I think it depends <laughs> upon, why yeah, not? it depends. Why, why not? What do I have to lose? Yeah. Because then they took the coaching. You can see if they did. You know, 100%. If, if they cry and run away, you know, it's not going to work. <laughs> not a good fit. <laughs> there, there's no crying in chemical there's distribution. No crying in sales. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mean market, man. <laughs> you got you got to be tough. <laughs> and what advice would you have for the people out there that are first line managers who want to move up? What's that big difference between leading individual contributors and leading other leaders? This is going to sound super squishy, but follow your heart. Right. If you got to understand what feels natural and what feels right for you as a person personally, right? Take the professional piece out of it. If you're not inspired and you're not driven and you don't get the joy of somebody else doing, not you doing, right? Then, then leadership's not for you, right? It's certainly not for the money because I've got sellers, you know, who make crazy commissions, right? And, and, you know, could, could surpass most of the leadership salaries, right? You, you do it because you have a passion to coach and to teach. Perfect. Hey, Helena. And it's got great. Appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's probably the best place. Helena Superior. Hey, what a great guest. I really enjoy talking with other sales leaders understanding their motives, their differentiators. And I think you get a lot out of hearing how other people are solving these particular problems. Uh, if you or your team is looking to up your game, 
check out our training courses over at b2brevenue.com. The letter B, the numeral two, the letter B, and then the word revenue.com. Isn't that a beautiful word, revenue? Also, if you'd like to support the show, please put a rating, a review, or even better, tell another sales leader or even your team uh, to check us out. Either this podcast or we got several others. We got the brutal truth about sales and selling, uh, which is uh, interview based about the very best reps in the world and what is working today. Uh, Sales questions, brutally honest answers, a daily Q and A uh, type show talking about uh, the questions that people are asking today and the answers that I have for them. Also. Uh, the B2B Revenue Leadership Show, where I, le- I talk to CEOs, CROs, and CMOs about what is working today. Oh, look at all that content. And if you happen to see my videos pass you by on LinkedIn, uh, Brian G. Burns, uh, give it a little thumbs up, uh, whether it's comedy or content. I try and break up the day with a little sales comedy, as well as some content about what is working today. Uh, little tips, tactics, techniques that have been working for me, different ways of looking at the sales world and how to get people's attention, uh, get conversations started, and keep those deals moving. Appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next time.